Oh, it's very good. It's good. Um, well, we want to get back started. We are going through the book of Galatians. And tonight, I, I want to do something a little different. But the, the title of the sermon tonight is Justification by Faith. And we're in Galatians chapter 2. And we've been looking at the section that runs from verse 11 down through verse 21. And tonight, we're going to focus mainly on verses 15 through 21. We looked at one, 11 through 14 last week. And there is enough in here to spend a month or two <laughs> uh, every day, uh, but we, we don't have that time to do that. But this is something that's going to be ongoing. You know, this is going to tie in well with the Living Faith Conference that we're going to do at the end of July, and so we'll get a lot more information on this. There's just so much in here that's, that's packed into these verses, and there's so much of it that is hotly debated in evangelicalism but that is clear. And we're gonna, we're, what I want to do, I want to talk through, I'm going to give you an introduction, and then we want to sort of expound on that introduction, and then we want to try to tie the introduction to the text and run through the verses, but then talk about a couple of words. All right? And so all of that, uh, just basically tonight, to get uh, what hopefully will be uh, a better understanding or a good understanding of what justification by faith looks like. And so if you will, in your Bibles, let's just get started. Galatians 2. And starting down in verse 11, let's read the whole section together, starting from verse 11. All right, in Galatians 2, 11. Now, when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed. For before certain men came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. And the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him, so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, If you, being a Jew, live in the manner of Gentiles and not as the Jews, why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles knowing that a man is not justified by works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. But if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is Christ therefore a minister of sin? Certainly not. For if I build again those things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I, through the law, died to the law that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. Let's pray. Father, God, we are so grateful to you, God, for justification by faith. We praise you, Lord, that it is not by works of the law. Uh, we are hopeless and destitute without Christ. And we attest, Lord, as your people here acknowledging tonight that by faith in Christ, by the cross of Christ, by the finished work of Christ, by his substitutionary atonement, that we are in Christ by faith and faith alone. We know that our works profit us nothing. And that if we feel as though, Lord, that somehow our salvation is merited through our works, then Christ died in vain. We certainly know uh, with Paul, we say, certainly not. Uh, that's not what we believe, Lord. We trust in you, trust in you alone. God, thank you for the infinite wisdom of your salvation. Lord, how you've designed this and how you've provided this salvation for us that is glorious in our sight, God. Thank you so much for this teaching through Scripture, God. These words uh, help us, Lord, to continuously apply these truths to our heart so that we can understand this, God. This is an uh, important, important teaching. So help us, Lord, to apply this to our lives. Help us to live for you by faith. And we love you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Justification by faith. It sounds easy, right? It sounds simple. Uh, many of you can probably, if I asked you to define justification by faith, can rattle off a quick uh, dictionary definition of that. No sweat, right? Just run down exactly what it is, and then that's it. 
But justification by faith is not simple in our understanding or our, in our living it out. Uh, this is something that's very challenging to stay on pace with, to understand, to apply. So challenging here that Peter, an apostle of Christ, one of the leaders of the early church, is found wandering away from it. Something in our flesh, something about how we think, how we operate, something about our nature just pulls us away from the simplicity that is in Christ, that is in the gospel. Pulls us away from this idea of justification by faith. And so what I want to do tonight through these verses is just get a a, a focus on it. Just to get a a simple sort of 30,000 foot view, if you will, of what this is and how we are to apply this, how we are to understand it. And then now we're going to have to, on a regular basis, apply this understanding to our lives and live according to this understanding so that we don't slip into this same error that we see Peter here slipping into. Not simple. I was uh, looking through the commentaries and I uh, came across a quote uh, from Luther uh, in talking about this. Uh, Considering our flesh, this is not simple, not easy. Uh, This is said, uh, Luther said, this is not something of which you will be master. You know, he he made the comment that those that will say, okay, yeah, I understand justification by faith. I can give you a definition. I can tell you what it means. I can can believe in it. Yeah, we're justified by faith. Faith alone in Christ alone. And they'll say that. But he says, Luther says, if you find someone talking about justification by faith that way, like they understand that they've got it mastered, they've got it down, no problem, right? Easy, cheesy, light and breezy. They know exactly what that is. They don't know what they're talking about. Living according to an understanding of justification by faith, Luther says, is hard. It's not something that you'll be master of. It's going to be something of which that you are always a pupil. As long as you're a Christian, you're going to be a pupil of justification by faith and how that applies to you. It will always be your master. He says that we, as believers, sense it as something like a a great taste that we want to grasp or we want to fully comprehend but we'll never completely get there, and it'll always be some, something that we hunger and thirst for. And Jesus Christ in Matthew 5, 6 in the Beatitudes said that those who hunger and thirst for righteousness will be blessed, right? It's something that we're always going to be grasping, always going to be reaching for. And so let's start our, our conversation with this. The first thing I want to talk about is a man has a dilemma, okay? We have a dilemma. We've got to set the context for this. Our dilemma is is that we are wickedly sinful, totally depraved, okay? From our natures, every part of us is corrupt. Doesn't mean that we're as wicked as we could be. We're not all running around like a bunch of Hitlers, right? But every aspect of our lives is completely depraved. Our thinking is depraved. Our reasoning is depraved. Our emotions are depraved. Desires depraved. Our understanding is darkened. Every piece of us is wicked down to the core. And so it's that total sinfulness of man that has separated us or put us at enmity with a holy God. And so the question becomes, in Job, Job asks the question, how can a man be just with God? How can a man be just with God? Look at us. Look at our state. Look at our condition. How can we be right with God? Habakkuk answers that question and says that the just will live by their faith. It's by faith that we're right with God. And here we have the the introduction to this subject of justification by faith. This is something that's easily taken for granted, all right? And the idea, the propensity in our flesh is to constantly rail against that free gift of righteousness in Christ, to rail against that free gift in Christ, and to try to gain or achieve righteousness in our own, on our own in our own works, according to what we do. And it's really dangerous, really simple to slip into that way of thinking, uh, but we can't do that, all right? And that's something that you've gotta be aware of, you've gotta be able to identify. Uh, we need to be able to spot that and we need to, need to be able to avoid it. But why is it? Is it that justification or being right with God, and this is what we need to understand, is not simply a matter of what you do. And we're going to look at this from two different angles. The first part is this. Justification, or our dilemma, our problem with 
our hostility towards God, our rebellion against God, our separation from God is not simply about what we do. It's about our heart. If it were strictly just actions, well, you stop those actions and now you're right with God? No, it's, it's a matter of man's heart. It's like it goes back to this uh, understanding of uh, the passage of Scripture where Jesus says, okay, if you want to be right with God, then cut off your hand, gouge out your eye. If cutting off your hand or gouging out your eye would get you to heaven, <laughs> sounds like a pretty good deal, okay? I'll just one swift, swift motion of the ax, we'll take care of that, done deal. Right now, if you believe that sin is merely something that you do with your eye, or do with your hand, then just pluck out your eye or cut off your hand, right? But sin isn't simply a matter of what you do with your hand, what you see with your eye. Sin is a matter of the heart, and it's out of the heart of man that sin comes. Evil, murder, slander, divisiveness, all of that malice comes out of man's heart. So you have to understand, first of all, our condition and our need for justification is not simply what you do, it's the heart of man that puts us at enmity with God. It's who we are by nature, okay? Now the reverse of this is also true, we're gonna have to look at this in a moment, is when you're considering whether or not you are justified by faith in Christ, and you start looking at your performance, evidences in your life for saving graces, all right, evidences in your life for the demonstrations of genuine saving faith, which are the works that you do, your performance, Again, it's not a matter of what you do that makes you right with God. It's a matter of the heart. It's a matter of who you are by nature. We're going to need to understand that. All right. The basic root, though, the basic root of this problem is in our heart, not in our actions. It's what we are. All right. No matter what you do, no matter what you do, you cannot change your nature. So settle it in your mind. When we're talking about justification by faith alone in Christ alone, there is nothing that you can do. There's no law keeping, no obedience. There's nothing that you can do to change your nature. You are by nature a sinner, separated from God and without hope apart from Christ. You're a sinner. There's nothing that you can do. There's no amount of law keeping. All right, go to Romans 3. And I want to give you some context for this. Romans 3. And look down first, Romans 3, at verse 21. Romans chapter 3, verse 21. But now, the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I've heard it said this way, that you are a sinner, therefore you sin. It's not that you sin and are therefore a sinner. You are a sinner by nature and therefore you act in accordance with your nature and you sin. It's not a matter of what we do necessarily, it's a matter of who we are, it's a matter of the heart, and out of the heart leads the sin. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, verse 24, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at present time his righteousness that he might be the just might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Christ. Now God's solution to our dilemma here is faith in Christ. The solution to your and my problem of being at enmity with God because of who we are, God's solution for that is Christ. Christ provides a solution. The vehicle through which we have that solution is faith. All right? This is by faith. This is not mere intellectual assent. Okay? It's not just agreeing with a set of facts. You can't understand a dictionary definition of faith and agree with the historical facts about Christ and be saved. All right? It's not intellectual assent. It's personal trust in his death. 
It's identification with Christ in his death, in his burial, in his resurrection, understanding that he died, that he was raised from the dead, that he was God in the flesh, and then it's total commitment to submit to him as Lord. It's living in that kind of trust, okay? When we say that we've got faith in Christ, we live completely and fully, totally trusting in the Lord. It's a, a committed living out of our trust, our faith in Christ, not merely intellectual assent, all right? So now, I want to give you a background. Go back to uh, Galatians 2. And let's look at how Paul, the, the, the important thing I want to get for you tonight is this argument. The, the argument or the, the, um, the train of thought that Paul is going through here, we want to understand that, and I want to give you a setup for it first from the verses that we looked at last week. In verse 11, Peter had come to Antioch, withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed. He's to be blamed for perverting or straying away from the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's compromised the gospel. Now, how did he do that? Verse 12, for before certain men came from James, and these were, we found out last week, were uh, Jews that had come from Jerusalem, he would eat with the Gentiles, but when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. Now, he was having full and complete fellowship with Gentiles, eating with them, right? Disregarding, if you will, the dietary laws that had been in place, now he's eating freely, fellowshipping freely with Gentiles. Now, verse 13, what was the result of that? As a result of Peter's behavior, the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite. They pretended. They joined him in his pretense, okay? Joined him in his hypocrisy so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. Verse 14, but when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, they weren't walking rightly, as the Bible says. Uh, they were, by their conduct, perverting or corrupting the gospel. I said to Peter before them all, if you being a Jew live in the manner of the Gentiles and not as a Jew, and not as the Jews, now Peter had been living, freely fellowshipping with Gentiles, not keeping the dietary laws himself, not obeying the ceremonial laws at all. I mean, he was living like a Gentile, right? So if he was living like a Gentile and not as the Jews, then Peter, why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? Now, what we found out was that in Peter shrinking away from the Gentiles and now only having fellowship with the Jews that came from James, what Peter was in effect saying was that if you wanted to belong to the people of God here, you've got to keep the laws. You've got to keep the dietary laws. You need to, in, a, in essence, be circumcised. You've got to keep the Mosaic law in order to be among or belong to the people of God. All right, And that's what, in effect, he was saying with his behavior, with his conduct. And he did that out of fear of persecution. We talked about that last week, right? But now that brings us to verse 15. In verse 15 here, Paul has already made the claim that Peter has corrupted the gospel by retreating from fellowship with Gentiles. He's already corrupted the gospel, but now he's going to prove his case, right? He's going to state his claim. And in verse 15, we, Paul says, who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles. Mainly, mainly saying that they're just Jews. They were born into Judaism, raised in Judaism. They were circumcised. They're living under the covenant promises of God as Jews. And they weren't sinners of the Gentiles. It's not that Paul is saying here they're not sinners. Paul would be the first to admit that he's a sinner. All right, But he's not sinners of the Gentiles, meaning that he's not. they weren't outside the covenant. They're Jews. They've been circumcised. They've been keeping the law. They're a part of the promises of God. And so he's saying, in effect, listen, Peter, you and I, we've been a part of these covenant promises. We grew up in Judaism. If anyone's kept the law, we have, right? And he's saying, if we are in the covenants of God and Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, look at verse 16, knowing, now we know, Peter, you know, I know that a man is not justified, not made right, by the works of the law, but by faith in Christ. Even if we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. Now let's break that down a little bit. Some, in this passage of scripture, there's a lot in here, and just sometimes breaking it down a little bit at a time just helps you to get the, the total picture a little easier, understand it a little bit easier. Knowing that a man is not justified by works of the law, 
but by faith in Jesus Christ. That's what we're talking about here. That's the claim. Listen, Peter, you've started compelling by your behavior these Gentiles to live like Jews. What you're communicating to them is that in order to be right with God, to, be belo to belong to the people of God, to be among the people of God, you've got to keep the law. Now, Peter, that's not being straightforward about the gospel. There is no law keeping that is going to make you right with God. You need to do what's right here. Even if we, even we have believed, Paul says, in Christ Jesus, that we might believe, be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. Now he's saying here, Peter, even you and I, you and I, Peter, have believed in Christ for our justification. We've believed in Christ for our justification because we know, Peter, you and I, even though that we grew up in Judaism, even though we've been under the, co the covenants, we know that's not how anyone gets saved. All right, You and I have believed on Christ in order to be right with God, that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. And then he makes a summary statement, for by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. There's no amount of law keeping that can be done here for us to be right with God. That's simply not how the gospel goes out. It's not how the gospel, that's not how people get saved, all right? Now in this, Peter, because of his conduct, has compromised this truth, all right? He's compromised the gospel. The gospel here, the reason that Paul is making this claim is because the gospel stands in authority over Peter, stands in authority over Paul, stands in authority over you and I. It's the gospel that has that authority, not Peter, to do anything to change that. And this is the truth here, that simply by justification, by faith alone, or a right standing with God comes strictly by faith alone in Christ alone. And that's the only way to be right with God, okay? Paul makes the statement that Peter is compelling Gentiles to observe the Mosaic law, to belong to the people of God by his behavior, and doing what the law commands will never be the justification for salvation, justification by faith. It's simply going to be all faith. No one is justified by works because all fail to keep the law, all right? So now he's defined the issue. We're talking about justification by faith. He's defined the problem. He's defined what Peter is doing. He's made that clear. And so then he's going to give now his argument to set, to argue that. He's going to give his argument to go against here what Peter's doing. Look at verse 17. And we'll go through this sort of quickly. But if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners. Is Christ therefore a minister of sin? Certainly not. All right? Now, this question that he's asking, he's basically saying, listen, if you, Peter, and I, Paul, if we seek to be justified in Christ, all right, if we've, seek, if we've sought justification or right standing with God, through faith in Christ, all right? And if we're then found to be sinners, and I want you to get the context for this, we've looked to Christ in faith to be saved, which means that we're no longer keeping the law to be saved. We no longer have our faith in the law or the works of the law to be saved. So now if in abandoning the law and putting our faith alone in Christ for salvation, if in that we're found to be sinners because we're not keeping the law, well, then Christ then would be responsible for our sin, wouldn't he? And Paul says, absolutely not. Okay, now imagine, Peter has stopped keeping the dietary laws. Jesus Christ did away with the dietary laws in Mark 7, right? Did away with them. We saw God do away with the dietary laws with the sheep falling in Acts 10 when Peter got his vision. I said, now put yourself in the situation of what Paul's saying here. Listen, Peter. We're coming to Christ by faith to be saved, which means we're not keeping that law anymore. So now, if we're not keeping that law anymore, and we're following Christ according to the teachings of Christ, then if we're sinners, that means you're saying Christ is responsible for our sin. And Paul is saying, absolutely not. Christ is not responsible for our sin. May it never be. Right? So here, he, that's the first statement in his argument. Christ is not responsible for the sin. The teaching of Christ about justification by faith is right, and we're doing right by abandoning that law and living by faith in Christ, all right? But then look at verse 18. For if I build again those things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor, transgressor, 
right? And what Paul's saying here is on the contrary. If I try to restore my right relationship with God by keeping the law, I'm in sin, right? And I, I want you to see, we'll talk about this more in a minute, but the application to you for this. If you've come to Christ for a right standing with God on the basis of faith in Christ, then you fall into sin, right? Or you have some difficulty, you question your salvation, maybe you've got difficulties with assurance, and you attempt to restore a right standing with God or to have an understanding of a right standing with God on the basis of keeping the law, on the basis of doing good works, on the basis of how you live. If you do that, you're in sin. So now think about that for a minute, and we're going to talk about it more. But you come to Christ, and you come to Christ by faith. You realize, I am a wicked sinner. I'm depraved. I need a Savior. And you look to Christ, and you look to his work on the cross, and his substitution on your behalf. And you think, boy, I have nothing to offer God. I am empty-handed here. I am spiritually bankrupt. I am without hope apart from Christ. And if I died right now, I'd go to hell. And you think to yourself, man, Jesus Christ did that? And he did that for me. And I believe it. And I'm going to live by faith in Christ. I want Christ and Christ alone. There is nothing good in me. There's nothing that I can do that will merit myself before God. Nothing that I can do that will make me right before God. And on the basis of faith, you turn from your sin and you turn to Christ and you begin living for him, right? And you go, just like these believers in Galatians, just like Peter. You go and you run and you run hard, you run well, you're on a mountaintop, you've been saved, praise God. And you go for a while and then the, things get tough and you start questioning and you start having difficulty. And then you start thinking to yourself, man, I'm still struggling with this sin over here. I'm still having a hard time with my life. Am I really a Christian? I mean, look at what I'm doing here. I'm not as committed to my daily devotions as I should be. I'm not fully through that whole lust issue I've been having or that whole anger issue I've been having or whatever it is. And I'm, I just haven't conquered that. And I just fell into that sin again. Or I've got this issue with pride or apathy or whatever it is. And you look at your performance and you think to yourself, man, I'm just, you're not where you want to be. And you start looking at your performance, looking at your life, looking at your obedience to the commands of Christ, apart from faith in Christ, and you start looking at what you do, you begin in the flesh to attempt to restore a right relationship with God on the basis of your works on the basis of keeping the laws of God, of, on the basis of obeying his commands. Now you're no longer trying to establish a right relationship with God based on faith. All of a sudden now you found yourself in the ditch of trying to establish a right relationship with God based on obedience to his commands. And that makes you a transgressor of what we're talking about here. And you're in sin for doing that. Now, that's really, really, really easy trap for genuine believers to fall into, right? And it creates a, a, it creates a circumstance that Martin Lloyd-Jones called uh, morbidity, where you, without faith in Christ, completely focused on your own performance, slip into this despair, <laughs> right, that comes by trying to justify yourself based on works of the law. And that's not faith in Christ. You've pulled away. Paul would say, why are you leaving so soon? Who's bewitched you? Why are you departing the gospel of God, the gospel of grace? Why are you departing justification by faith alone and going back to trying to justify yourself by works of the law? So if you try to restore that relationship with God based on your works, then you're going to fall into that sin, and it is sin. Right? Look at verse 19. For I, through the law died to the law that I might live to God, all right? Now, all believers, I want you to follow the train of thought here. All believers have died to the law so that they might live to God. You'll hear this excuse 
It's, it's a beautiful passage of scripture, but you'll hear it used as an excuse all the time. We're no longer under law, but we're under grace, right? Now, what that simply means is this, and it's the argument that, P, that Paul is making here. Justification is not, being right with God is not through keeping the law. So you're not under the Mosaic law anymore in the sense that you keep that law in order to be saved. You're not under law anymore. You're under salvation by faith alone in Christ alone. You're under salvation by grace. You're under grace. It does not mean that you, you just toss out the window all obedience to Christ. It doesn't mean you can get away with disobedience. You can live however you want to live. It's not what it means. As a system of salvation, as a way, as a means to be right with God, you're not under law anymore. You're under grace. But here, all believers died to the law so that they might live to God. And that live to God is another way of saying live by faith. It's by faith. Okay, we'll talk about that in a minute. Verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Now, in verse 20 here, you initially, you're identified with Christ. You're identified in his death, identified in his resurrection. If you're a genuine disciple of Christ, when God looks at you, he doesn't look at your works any longer in that sense. He's looking at Christ and the finished work of Christ on the cross. He sees you identified in Christ, in his death, and in his resurrection. When Christ died, it's as if you died with him. When Christ was raised, it's as if you are being raised with him and one day will be. So it's identification with Christ. But then now, after that truth, based on that truth, the next part of the statement is, the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me, that now your life, the Christian life, is lived out by faith in Christ. So when you live, as you're living, as you're coming across temptation, all right, as you're put in situations where you've got a choice to make, you're living your life based on faith in Christ. Every decision, every action, it's all based on faith in Christ. It's, what would the Lord have me do? What does the Lord want me to do? Out of the overflow of a new nature, you start making decisions for Christ and against you. For Christ and against your sin. It's life lived by faith in Christ. But now look at verse 21. I do not set aside the grace of God. For if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. Okay? Therefore it follows. If anyone requires law, if you require law keeping for yourself, you're rejecting the grace of God. You're rejecting the grace of God. And in returning to the law, going back to the point we made a minute ago, if you attempt by your works, by your performance, by what you're doing, to restore a right relationship with God, then what you are in effect doing is you're rejecting the grace of God and you're saying the cross of Christ is of no effect and that Christ died in vain. That's why it's sin, okay? So if you're attempting by your works to be right with God, if you're looking at your accountability, if you're looking at your performance, you've got your eyes on that and you're judging yourself based on that. If I do good, I am good. If I don't do good, I'm not good. And it's, not, it's a lot more subtle than that, right? When you're trying to, and you can't fall into that trap, if you're looking at those measures, if you're looking at your performance apart from faith in Christ, then you're establishing a righteousness of your own. And a righteousness of your own will not save. And you, in your actions, render the cross of Christ of no effect. Christ died in vain, if that's the case. That's why it's sin. Go to 1 John 3. Right? We want to tie in how this works. 1 John 3. This is really important. And it's just something that you are going to have to grapple with. Any good, vibrant, healthy church is a church that preaches hard against sin. A church that preaches hard for holy living. You've got genuine disciples in there that their, their foremost desire is just to live pleasing to God. And I want to live for Christ. 
I want Christ to be pleased. He's my Lord. He's my master. He saved me. It's just your, the desire of your heart with everything you are is to live for him. But now in that environment, the natural byproduct of that is a struggle with what we're talking about. It's going to be difficult in your flesh sometimes to understand where the line is. And we in our flesh, just like Peter is doing here, can easily cross over that line. And we can cross over that line and find ourselves in territory we don't need to be because it's sinful territory that will throw us into a death spiral and will get your mind tangled up. You've got to be vigilant against that. And the starting point of being vigilant against it is understanding, okay? And we'll try to give that more to you. But in 1 John 3, look down at verse 4. And if you're like me, this, this passage has given you trouble before, all right? Related to what we're talking about, this passage has given us difficulty. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him there is no sin. Now we know from looking at this before, what we're talking about here is a pattern of sin, a lifestyle of sin, okay, being characterized by sin. Verse 6, whoever abides in him does not practice sin. Whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whoever has been born of God does not sin. For his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he has been born of God. In this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. Now, back in Galatians 2, that passage, all right, has, it's a tough passage, and it's a good passage. It's a helpful passage in the sense that if you've been genuinely saved, and you've been justified, made right with God on the basis of faith alone in Christ alone, you've turned from your sin and are following Christ, then the Bible says you're not going to live in a pattern of sin. Now, how does that relate with living by faith in Christ? If you look at 1 John 3, and you hold that passage of Scripture up, as a standard by which you judge yourself, examine yourself, whether or not you're in the faith, and you do that apart from faith in Christ, you're going to be living a pattern of sin there's no hope of recovery from. All right? That passage is to be viewed by the disciple through the filter, through the lens of living a life of faith in Christ. If you have your eyes on Christ, trusting him, trusting him alone to save you, if you have your mind focused on Christ, living for him, if when you fall into sin, when you're battling sin and you're repenting of sin, and you've got your eyes on Christ and you're living by faith in Christ, then that, there isn't a pattern of sin, right? If you are in Christ by faith, then you live by faith in the Son of God and whatever is done in faith is not sin. It, it, you know, it, if I can make that clear, it's whatever is done not in faith is sin. If you're not living by faith, you're in sin. If, you're, if you have faith in Christ and you're living by faith, then those patterns in your life are going to be patterns generally of righteousness. You're going to struggle with the sin. And you're going to have difficulty with what you perceive as patterns in your life. But living by faith in the Son of God gives us victory over that, and you'll see progress. But it's by faith. If you are living, looking at your own performance, holding your own performance up against 1 John 3, and you're not looking at it by faith, you're going to be sorely disappointed. You're going to see that you don't have victory. You're going to see that sin. You, in essence, are looking at 1 John 3, attempting to restore a right relationship with God based on your works. That's a difficult, fine line to understand, right? It's something we can easily get our mind tangled up over. If you're living by faith, you turn from your sin, right? That sin doesn't have dominion over you in the sense that you are enslaved to it any longer. You've died to, this, to that sin. We still struggle, right? We still struggle in our sin. 
But if you're living by faith, you're continuously looking to Christ, you're going to see out of the, the, the outflow of your new nature in Christ is going to be victory over that, is going to be progress over that, is going to be a breaking of those patterns of sin in your life, right? And that's done by faith in Christ, not by you looking and working and gritting your teeth to get rid of it, right? Gritting your teeth, working in your own power to try to break those patterns in your life. It doesn't come that way. It comes by faith in Christ. If you're living by faith as a disciple of Christ, then just by the nature of living by faith, you break patterns in your life of sin. You're not in sin in that sense any longer. You've been delivered from that by faith in Christ. You're now a disciple of Christ. So it's a fine line, but that's when you look at your own performance, you, the Bible says to examine yourself, whether or not you're in the faith, right? And you are looking at yourself, examining yourself, whether you're in the faith. And that's not a process that should take you months and months to figure out. Have I a new nature in Christ? Has God changed me? This is all about nature and affections. Remember, it's not what you do, it's who you are. And who you are produces what you do. If you're living by faith in Christ, who you are has been changed, and now what you do begins to be transformed. But it comes back to the issue of nature. Have you been changed by God? Have you been saved? And do you see now progress in your life toward Christ, toward godliness? Is the primary motivation for what you do affection or love for Christ? Is the primary motivation for what you do, is the nature from which you do those things, is that nature a nature that hungers and thirsts for righteousness? It is, a na is it a nature that loves holiness and hates that sin? Is it a nature that wants to please Christ, that desires to live for him, that finds him infinitely appealing and valuable and precious? Is that the nature that you have now? Is it a nature that loves God's word, that loves righteousness, that hungers and thirsts for it, right? That hates the sin. Is that the nature that you have? If you have that nature, you've been saved by God. And you've been saved on the basis of faith alone in Christ alone. You've been transformed by him. You have a new heart in Christ. Now listen, if you've been transformed, if that's your nature, if that's who you are, if God has changed you that way, then those patterns that we see in 1 John 3 are broken. Those patterns aren't there. They don't apply to you in that way any longer. And you look at them based on faith in Christ, not based on your own works, not based on your own righteousness. If you start, now we can, as believers, and just like we see the Galatians doing here and Peter doing here, Believers in Christ can fall from or stray from that understanding and start living back according to works. They look at a passage like 1 John 3 and say, you know, I've got this sin and I've got this sin and I've got this sin and I'm not doing this and I'm not doing that and I'm not doing the other thing. And you know what? I only do this much here and I only do this much. And I'd rather, I mean, I think a Christian would do a lot more. And again, then you start trying to establish a right relationship with God based on your works, based on keeping the law, based on obedience and not on faith. But if you look like, okay, yes, if you look at yourself long enough, I've got this and I've got this and I've got this. You repent of that, you trust Christ to deliver you from it, and you live by faith. Your eyesight needs to be on Christ. That is a reality, right? And you're going to find sin in your life from now until the day you die, until you're finally and fully glorified. You find that sin and you gouge it out of your life. And how do you do that? Do you do it by looking at passages like 1 John 3 and agonize over your own performance and try to do that in your own power? Or is that done through faith in Christ? Do you try to establish a right relationship with God based on obedience to those commands? Or are you living by faith? If you live by faith, that's where the victory is. Christ, I'm trusting you. Christ, I want free from this. I want to please you. I want to live for you. Christ, please help me. I need victory over this sin. I want to live for you, Christ. It's faith in Christ that does that, all right? So it's just a fine line, and it's something we've got to be constantly aware of, but that's the way 
that works. And that's here in Galatians 2, in a way demonstrated by the conduct of Peter, what we see happening in this chapter. And it's what we fall into all the time. But I want, to see, I want you to see next a couple of definitions here. I'll give you a couple of definitions. The first in verses 15 and 16, the first word that we need to look at is the word justification and exactly what justification means, okay? Justification, dikaiutai, it's, it's a, um, there's a word, justification based on a verb and there's justification based on a noun. A noun is dikaiosune. Literally, it's the word, it can be translated justification or it can be translated righteousness. So when the Bible's talking about righteousness, or about justification, this is what we're dealing with here. We're dealing with the righteousness that is required for us to be right with God. We need righteousness and we have none of our own, all right? So justification. Justification is a legal declaration of your right standing with God. It is God in his courtroom, in a sense, dropping the gavel and pronouncing you not guilty. That's what you need to be right with God. Now. This is a decree, but it's also imputation. It's also crediting to you the righteousness that you need. We need righteousness in order to be right with God. We need a legal declaration of not guilty, and we need to be made right. So it's the giving you of Christ's righteousness, crediting that to your account, and pronouncing you not guilty. Now, a judge who declares the guilty righteous is a judge who's violated standards of justice. We all understand how that works. The Bible says he who justifies the ungodly is an abomination to God. But that's exactly what's going on here. If you blanket pronounce someone justified, that's what's being talked about there. That's justifying the ungodly, which is an abomination to God. Here, this justification is a legal declaration based upon the finished work of Christ alone. So it's not just a blanket legal declaration. It's got teeth to it, all right? You're under a curse because you cannot keep the law. Everyone who cannot keep the law is under a curse. Jesus Christ, if you're a disciple of Christ, Jesus Christ took that curse for you. And in Christ, because he took the curse for you, you can be made legally declared righteous, legally declared justified on the basis of Christ. And you get the righteousness of Christ. Romans 8.33 says, who will bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. When God justifies on the basis of Christ, there is no one who can bring a charge against you. It has been nailed to the cross. It's done with. Right, there's no one that can bring a charge. God justifies. Then, righteousness, justification, is given by faith as a free gift. Not to those who work, but to those who have faith in Christ. Romans 4 talks about this. If you work a full week, at the end of the week, you get a paycheck. Right? If you work for God, thinking you're going to be right with God, it's almost as if you're saying, yeah, you owe me. And God doesn't owe you anything. So justification doesn't come on the basis of works. It comes on the basis of faith alone in Christ alone. It's a free gift. And that's the legal declaration that you're right with God, not guilty. And it's also the imputation or the crediting, the giving by free gift of Christ's righteousness, of righteousness to you. Now that's different than forgiveness. Forgiveness, you can go out and sin again. All right? That record may be cleared. You can go out and sin again. It's different than pardon. Pardon, your record may be cleared, but you can go out and sin again. Now, this is legally declared righteous. And when you're declared righteous by God, you are righteous in Christ. That's the way God views you, all right? But then next in verse 15, it talks about, or in 16, it says the works of the law. You're justified, made right with God, made righteous by Christ's righteousness. By the works of the law, it says there, works of the law is keeping of the Mosaic commandments. Now, there's one aspect of this which is legalistic. That's simply saying that those who rely on keeping commands to merit right standing with God. That's legalism. If you rely on the law to gain merit before God, that's legalism. And if you're being a legalist, you're under a curse. You're under the curse still, right? Or, and also here, works of the law is a summary for works provided or prescribed by the Mosaic law. Works of the law are strictly the being in obedience to the Mosaic law. Human obedience to commandments cannot function 
as the basis for which you are right with God. Human obedience to commands cannot be your basis for your right standing with God or not, for right relationship with God. It's got to be on the basis of faith, okay? So now, let's look at faith. We've got justification. It talks about works of the law. We know that justification does not come by obedience to commands, does not come by our obedience to the works of uh, the keeping the Mosaic law. It comes on the basis of faith, uh, on the basis of faith. Christ is our righteousness. If the righteousness you need for a right standing with God is in Christ and through Christ, then everything you're about is Christ. You keep your focus on Christ. You live for Christ. You think through what Christ would have you do. You live according to his principles. You live according to his teaching, according to his word. You live for him. You're his property. You put all of your trust, all of your commitment in Christ. Christ is your righteousness. Make sense? If he's your righteousness and you need that righteousness to be saved, then faith is a total commitment to Christ. It's commitment and trust in his work, in his righteousness alone to save you. It's Christ that is our righteousness. Not, there's no righteousness in our own. And so we trust in Christ crucified. God sees nothing in you, sees nothing in me that impresses him. You thought about that? There's nothing in you that God sees that impresses him. You can't do anything outside of Christ to please God. Your righteousness comes through Christ alone. Now, should you see anything in yourself that impresses you? No. So what are you doing looking at your own works? If you've fallen into this trap and you're trying to establish a right relationship with God by keeping works of the law, by obeying commands, I mean, where does that end? Take that out to its logical conclusion. Are you ever going to do enough? Are you ever going to have the right motives? Are you ever going to completely have the right heart in what you do? No, because you're contending with this flesh. Stop looking at works that way. If you look at works that way, you're trying to establish righteousness again based on keeping the commandments. And you, you're in sin. You're a transgressor because you're rendering the cross of Christ of no effect. Christ died in vain. So what this means here is that you can't look at your works and think that anything commends you to God. So when you're examining yourself, look at the nature. Look at what God has done in you. Do I have a new heart in Christ? Have I been transformed by God? Am I a new creation? And then out of that new creation, you look and you say, man, are the, the way I'm living, what I'm doing, victory over the sin, progress in the sin, my sanctification, right? My understanding of the Christian walk. Am I making progress? Am I living for Christ by faith in Christ? Is that the outflow of my new nature? Do I have affection for Christ? Is that the motivating factor behind my actions? You know, you walk into a room, you sit in a chair, nothing happens by accident. You do that for a reason. You know, maybe you saw somebody you wanted to sit by. Maybe that chair was not around anybody and you didn't want to be around anybody. You know, maybe that chair is just, you know that one's comfortable. You know that one doesn't squeak. You know, you, everything you do, you base on a decision. There's a reason for it, all right? Is what you're doing on the basis of a love for Christ, out of a desire to obey him, out of a desire, a hunger and a thirst for righteousness? Is it based out of the new nature? Is it based out of a new creation? Or are you merely trying to establish righteousness with God on the basis of your own works, on the basis of your own power? You got to answer those questions for yourself. This is not a works righteousness, right? This is a salvation that results in works. But you've got to determine, am I a new creature in Christ? Have I been saved by God? And are the things that I'm doing, is this performance that I'm looking at? Is it based on a new creation, based on a new heart, based on a new nature, okay? If you start looking again at strictly what you're doing on the basis of you gritting it out and bearing with it and white knuckling it to get it done, Apart from faith in Christ, you're in sin. God doesn't see anything that impresses us. That leads us back to where we started, that this is not simple. This is something that genuine believers fall into all the time. Conversations after conversation after conversation. Maybe you've counseled people that have had difficulty with that. They look at their lives and they say, you know what? I don't see anything good. And you know what? You, it's right. <laughs> and you're not going to. 
you know, the thing about, you know, I remember hearing, I didn't understand, I remember hearing, I was a, you know, a new believer, just get converted, and you, know, you think about guys like John MacArthur, or, you know, somebody that's been saved a really long time. You think to yourself, wow, you know, what's it like to be saved for 30 years, you know, and you must be really holy. <laughs> and you ask them, you say, does it get any easier? Like, well, no. I mean, the longer you live in Christ, the longer you live for Christ, by sanctification and by his spirit, the more sensitive you become to sin. You know, in the very beginning, there were just big, you know, big things. It was just, you know, I wanted God to just sort of lop them off. And over time he did. You know, he lops off the big things. But when you really understand your sinfulness and you really start looking at who you are in the flesh, and there is nothing there to be impressed with. There's nothing there you're going to be pleased with. You look at that, there's going to be just disgust, right? It's like Paul in Romans 7 saying, wretched man that I am. Now, that's the Apostle Paul. So you continue to look at yourself that way, that's what you're going to get. So now, as a result of that, do you then go back and attempt, I've said it many times, to make sure that you're right with God on the basis of you doing better? Or is you doing better, the only hope you have for that, based on faith in Christ? Yes, you want to do better. You know, there's sin in your life, sin in my life, that we want to gouge out of our life. If you look at that sin and you say, I'm going to do better here, I am determined. <laughs> I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, I'm going to get that sin out of my life. I'm disgusted by it, I don't want to do that anymore. And you, and you start working on it. And maybe you stumble. Maybe you have a difficult time. You think to yourself, man, would a Christian really have this much difficulty with this? I'm not a slave to sin any longer. I shouldn't be having this kind of trouble. And so I need to try harder then. I just need to try harder, try harder. And maybe you pray, God, please help me. God, please help me. God, please help me. But there's no real faith there. It's just, okay, I'm just going to gouge this out of, sin out of my life. And you're thinking to yourself, well, Man, if I can get past this sin, if I can have victory over this sin, what that's demonstrating to me is that, I'm, that God has saved me, that I'm right with God. Maybe you got an understanding of doctrines of grace and you think to yourself, I know God is the one that saved. How do I know that God saved me if I can get rid of this sin? So you know what? I'm going to get rid of this sin and prove that I'm right with God. And you do that. You go to work on that. You got your eyes focused on yourself and you're looking at that and you're running and running and running and failing and failing and failing. But then you say, okay, that's trying to establish a right standing with God based on your own performance. You've got to switch that around. All of that for the genuine disciple is based on faith in Christ. You look at yourself, you're going to be and you should be disgusted. And I'm saying the, the closer you get to Christ, the more disgusted with yourself you should be. The more mature you are as a believer, the worse you should feel about yourself, right? Right? So you either let that send you into a downward spiral of depression, morbidity, as Martin Lloyd-Jones calls it, introspection, or you keep your eyes focused on Christ. You know what? Listen, I look at myself, I see no good. But I love Christ and I want to live for him. I want to gouge this sin out of my life. I want to be holy and pleasing to him. I want to obey him. And you get up in the morning and you say, okay, by faith, in Christ, I'm going to live this life. By faith in Christ, God, please help me. And you obey him. When you're faced with sin, you don't do the sin, you obey Christ. Now, sometimes you'll sin. But you continue by faith in Christ to win victory over that. By faith in Christ looking at your performance. You know, is what is happening in my life Evidence that God has saved me. Evidence that he's worked on me. Evidence of faith. Is it evidence of Christ? And you walk that way. You live by faith. And if you do that, that living by faith is what gives the victory. If you ask, and I have an older believer, it's been around for a long time, been in the Lord for a long time. You, you do. You have progressive. A person that's not being sanctified is not saved. If you're being sanctified, that's a good indication that you are genuinely converted.
So these guys, you know, you, you're in Christ, you get sanctified, and you get sanctified, and you get sanctified, and you make progress, and you make progress, and you make progress. Sometimes that progress isn't as evident as you'd like it to be, but you're making progress. And the whole time, you just have your eyes focused on Christ, just trusting Christ. Out of your own, you know, it's like you put yourself on an autopsy table, you got yourself cut wide open, you got the microscope down there in all the dirt. You got to get your eyes out of the microscope and on Christ. And if you live that way, by faith in Christ, you make progress. But what we got to be careful of and what legalism is, is a taking your eyes off Christ, putting your eyes back on your own works and trying to be right with God based on your works. And listen, it's something that we've got to be cognizant of because any church that preaches the word of God, you know, any genuine disciple has a sensitive conscience and in that you can fall into this trap we see peter doing it here i've done it myself before it's not a pleasant place to be you got to live by faith in christ by faith in christ that's where great joy comes right when you when you fall into that trap of trying to establish right standing with god on the basis of your works on the basis of your performance one of the first things that happens is your Christian joy gets sucked right out. You become joyless. You become despairing. You, you don't have any hope in Christ any longer. Uh, you're not joy. That's like um, David saying, Lord, please restore to me the joy of my, my salvation, right? He's pleading for that. That's the first thing that goes. Also, what goes is assurance of your salvation, you no longer have faith, living by faith in Christ. You're not believing Christ, taking him at his word. Assurance goes out the window, and you believe yourself to be lost. Now, there are some that when your assurance wanes, it's because you're not converted. But there are others that are genuine disciples in Christ who find themselves in this trap, and the first thing that goes out the door is assurance of their salvation. They believe themselves to be lost because they're not walking by faith in Christ. So it goes back to that issue of live according to faith in Christ. Live by faith. Walk by faith. If by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you'll live. Um, so don't find yourself in that downward spiral. If you get in that position, put your eyes back on Christ, trust Him, take Him at His word, and live by faith. And that's where victory in the Christian life comes from. That's where joy in the Christian life comes from. All right? Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, God, help us to grasp the truth, God, that you've laid out in Scripture, just the, the, the cornerstone of our faith, this idea of, of justification by faith alone and Christ alone. God, help us to grasp that. Help us to live in that truth, God, to understand it, to apply it to our hearts. God, please protect us, Lord, from our fleshly tendency to try to establish right standing with you based on our works, based on obedience. There's just nothing in us, God, that can commend ourselves to you. There's nothing in us that is righteous. We need Christ's righteousness in order to be right with you. And we know that comes by faith. Lord, help us to live by faith in you, to turn from our sin, to wholly trust you, be wholly committed to you, to follow you with our whole heart. God, help us to live that way for your glory, God. And we want to be saved, Lord. We want to live for you. We want to be in heaven with you when we die. Lord, we just want to be we want to be Christ people, as we were talking about this morning. Lord, help us to do that, Lord, for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.